new players from our last panel, like Rubbermaid, Maiden Space, NIH, NCATS, and Burke. Did I say Rubbermaid? <laughs> okay, how are we doing? My guys are in trouble on that one. Thank you for that. Okay, hopefully that's, that's the, uh, the last one I'm going to say there. Sorry about that Tupperware. I think it's because Cindy was working so hard um, on, on the BD side of that after, we, after he described his uh, experiment. So many of these players are investing in space as an achievable destination for human activity, research, and innovation. In a few minutes, we'll be joined by someone who has played an important role in changing the equation of what we can accomplish in space and on Earth by embracing seemingly impossible ideas. However, before we introduce Elon Musk, we have an exciting announcement uh, as we've increasingly talked about bringing in these new innovative users like Tupperware, <laughs> to conduct research to not only benefit life here on the earth, but also to benefit those businesses. Everyone in this room will be familiar with a company that will be the newest part of the space R&D community. Please join me in welcoming the Target Corporation as our newest ISS user. Target will be launching an international space station research competition in the fall aimed at solving a global issue that is relevant to their industry. Please welcome Cindy Buteau, who you saw earlier on the panel for Leo commercialization, to talk more about the Target Research Challenge. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. Um, so. Uh, we talked earlier about our uh, mission to use the International Space Station as an innovation platform and to look at solving these big challenges. We are so happy to announce that Target uh, is looking at uh, solving or uh, understanding more sustainable cotton production using the International Space Station. This is really important. Um, Target is such a good partner from a social responsibility standpoint. They have announced a series of sustainability goals, long-term and short-term, and they've also uh, started looking at green innovation technologies. What we're doing now with this uh, Cotton Sustainability Challenge is we're looking at the International Space Station as the platform to look at things like gene expression with seeds, water and membrane technologies, and remote sensing applications that could result in more sustainable cotton production. And I bet you guys didn't know that in today's world, it takes about 700 gallons of water to produce one cotton t-shirt. And what Target is doing is looking out at their whole supply chain from a sustainability standpoint trying to learn something through this challenge on the space station, bring it down, back down here on the Earth for that more sustainable production. So again, we couldn't be happier. Uh, we're very pleased to announce this partnership. There is a website that you can see behind me that has now gone live. It's going to have all the details of this challenge, which is going to kick off in September. Uh, so stay tuned for that, and again, very happy uh, to announce this partnership with Target. Greg? We're excited to share that through this competition, Target will be investing significantly in space-based research, enabling new projects to fly uh, to the ISS. All right, I love that. This is another great step in our nation's utilization and investment in space-based research. 
We're proud that CASIS has facilitated more than $100 million in outside non-NASA funding uh, to ISS National Lab research to date. Target, we're really excited to be working with you and to see new innovative research head up to the space station. You can learn more online, and all of you researchers and implementation partners out there, they'll be looking for your ideas. So let's move on to the next highly anticipated part of the program, a conversation with, with Kirk Shireman and Elon Musk. From a logistical standpoint, Elon and Kirk uh, will be taking questions after their, after their talk. There are microphones stationed on that side of the room and that side of the room, and I see them. So we'll be uh, taking uh, questions from uh, those microphones because of the congestion uh, in the audience. Elon Musk is a true visionary leader who has helped to redefine multiple industries. We're honored to have him join the ISS R&D conference for the second time. He was with us two years ago in Boston, showing his commitment and passion for the International Space Station. He founded SpaceX in 2002. It's his third successful venture after the innovative companies Zip2 and PayPal. On May 22, 2012, Musk and SpaceX made history when the company launched its Falcon 9 rocket into space with an unmanned capsule. The vehicle was sent to the International Space Station with a thousand pounds of supplies for the astronauts, uh, marking the first time a private company had sent a spacecraft to the International Space Station. Since then, SpaceX has generated many significant milestones and has delivered hundreds of innovative experiments to the ISS from many companies and organizations in this room today. In addition to SpaceX, uh, Elon is the co-founder, CEO, and product architect for Tesla, a company that is redefining the automotive industry. When I think about innovation beyond boundaries, the theme for our conference, I cannot think of a better representation of that concept in our generation. Please join me in welcoming Elon Musk and ISS Program Manager Kirk Shireman to the stage. Okay, I'm, I'm getting an indication there was a little bit of delay uh, in his transportation. <laughs> the second faux pas, three strikes, I'm out. But uh, I'm not going to fill your time. Kirk and Elon are going to co come up momentarily. They're going to be stepping up to the stage, and they'll start the conversation. Thank you. Good afternoon. We thought we'd start off by, uh, by uh, making Greg very uncomfortable, so I hope we were successful. Where's Greg? He ran away. All right. So I hope we, I hope we made you uncomfortable, Greg. Uh, very good. So uh, Elon, thanks so much for, for being here today. Um, uh, Elon commuted from the West Coast this morning, so uh, we appreciate you uh, taking the time and coming out here and talking with us. Um, Absolutely. Thanks for having me. We've had, uh, we've had a pretty good conference so far, at least in my opinion. Over 1,000 right. people signed up for the first time, so yeah. a significant increase. And uh, lots of people interested in, uh, in, in space, in low-Earth orbit, and the International Space Station, and work that's going on. So uh, um, anyway, we're very, uh, very excited about the work that's going on and excited to have you here today, too. Great. Thanks for having me. So uh, you were here uh, a number of years ago, July, uh, in 2015, it's not that long ago, I guess, two years ago, and had a, had a discussion like this with Mike Suffredini. And a lot of things have happened since uh, 2015 uh, for SpaceX. So can you, uh, can you talk about how things have gone, how, how they've progressed, uh, how you're feeling about how the industry and, and SpaceX in particular have progressed? Sure. Well, I, I, think, I think we, we are entering a new era of space exploration. Uh, which is extremely exciting. 
Um, and it's, uh, it's not just SpaceX, but there's a number of other companies that uh, have developed uh, new approaches. Uh, uh, NASA is taking new approaches to things, which is really exciting. Um, in, in the way that the, the contracting has been done for Space Station Resupply, I think is a great model uh, that frankly should be adopted throughout government. Um, I spoke a little bit about this at the uh, Governor's Conference um, and it was actually using the NAS NASA uh, cargo resupply contracting uh, process as um, a, a really great model for uh, government in general. Um, you know, it's where you have two competitors, uh, uh, fixed price, uh, milestone based, where the hot milestones are, are primarily uh, hardware oriented. Um, and then if one of the two companies that's, com that's competing um, does not um, reach their milestones, then the remainder of the milestones are, are competed to another company. And that's what happened with Cargo Resupply. It started off with SpaceX and Kistler. Kistler made some progress, but wasn't going to get across the finishing line. And then Orbital Sciences was uh, competed for the second slot, and they did get across the finishing line. And now both SpaceX and Orbital um, uh, are providing NASA with cargo services to the space station. Um, and having that competitive dynamic um, is, is, I think, just a very powerful, powerful function uh, for getting a great outcome for the, the NASA as the customer. Um, and I think that that's just a great, that was a great model, really well executed. And to the degree that's applicable in other areas of NASA or the government, I think um, that's, there's the potential for uh, revolutionary progress mm -hmm. on that front. Um, so for, from, a, from a technical standpoint, the, the, the biggest uh, thing that's happened in the last couple of years, which I'm really excited about and I think makes a difference for access to space, is the landing of the uh, Falcon 9 rocket booster. Um, and then the, that, yeah. um, and if you ever get a chance to go out to the, 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 the Cape um, uh, or Vandenberg to see that, I'd really recommend it. It's really pr pretty fun. <laughs> so, um, and um, there'll be a lot of those flights in the remainder of the year. We've got about a dozen flights still to go this year. Um, and then uh, after landing, reflying that same booster uh, with minimal work to the booster. Um, and. Um, and, and we, we believe we can get to the point where, in, in the not too distant future, in fact, probably by by next year, where the uh, yeah. and, and 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 the key, the key to that is that uh, um, all you do is inspections, um, and um, no hardware is changed. Uh, not even the paint. <laughs> so <laughs> this is very important. <laughs> uh, so that, that's our aspiration for, for next year. Um, obviously, while paying very close attention to mission assurance and reliability, um, but we think we've got at least a technical path to, to achieving that. Um, and then the, uh, we're, I think we're quite close to being able to recover the, the fairing. Um, so it's a, there's a, a huge nose cone on the front of uh, Falcon 9, which is a 5.2 meter diameter nose cone. You can fit a, basically a whole sort of uh, city bus in there. And, uh, and, and that, just that, that bearing alone with all of its systems and the acoustic damping and qualification all that and separation system, um, that's about a five or six million dollar um, piece of equipment. And um, the analogy I use with my team is like, guys, imagine we had, you know, Six million dollars in a, a, a pallet of cash, and that was, you know, six million dollars is falling through the sky, and would we try to catch it? <laughs> I say we do. I say we give it a shot. You know, worst case it ends up at the bottom of the ocean, but maybe we do catch it and then pay six million dollars. Let me know when that pallet of cash is coming back. Yeah, I mean. I'd like to give it a shot, too. You know, it might as well be a pallet of cash, uh, because it costs $6 million, so... Um, and, uh, but I think, we, I think we've got a decent shot of recovering the fairing by the end of the year. 
um, and, and possibly reflight by either late this, this year or early next. Um, and that just leaves the, uh, the upper stage of the rocket. Uh, upper stage is about 20% uh, of the cost of the mission. Um, so if we get boost stage and, and fairing, we're right around 80% reasonable. And then um, I think, I, we're, I think we, for, for a lot of missions, we can even bring the second stage back. Um, so we're going to try to do that. Um, although our primary focus will be on uh, the, our Dragon, over the next, particularly over the next year or so, our Dragon 2 spacecraft, uh, which is what will, which is the Crew, crew Dragon, next generation Dragon spacecraft, which has got uh, all of the ECLIS systems and the uh, ability to do uh, a launch abort um, all the way to orbit. And, um, uh, and, and do an automated docking maneuver, so it's not, it, does, it, it doesn't need to be both with the aid of the arm, it can do a direct uh, docking maneuver. Um, and then that will be the, once that's operational, the new method of taking both cargo and crew to the space station. Um, so if I say, what's, what's our primary focus? It's making sure we stay on track for um, uh, getting, getting crew to station, mm -hmm. um, as we promised NASA um, around the middle of next year. It's going to be real exciting. I think it's going to be great for getting the public uh, yeah. fired up. You know, that's really... It's been a while since we launched uh, astronauts from U.S. soil, so yeah. we're, we're all looking forward to that. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and I'd just like to, 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 to thank um, people at NASA for uh, giving SpaceX a chance to, to do this. And I uh, just want a word of appreciation for the working relationship uh, with NASA, which is great. Um, in fact, I told the governors uh, last week that, you know, for a long time my password was, I love NASA. Uh, <laughs> that, that is actually true. <laughs> this is... <laughs> um. You know, you've just given, uh, you've given all the hackers around the world uh, something yeah. to go work I could, on. Uh, hopefully I don't have, like, some old email account somewhere still with that, you know, like, <laughs> yep. it's like, I've got to change this, we're going to cotton on. <laughs> Very good. So, how, how you talked a little bit about commercial crew? How is that going? I know uh, it's you know flying flying humans. There's more systems involved. Of course, the risk is higher. Yeah. How, how is that progressing? Um, you know, it's uh, it's been way more difficult than cargo for sure. Um, um, yeah. I mean, as soon as as soon as sort of people enter the picture, it's it's really a giant step up in. Um, Making sure things go right, you know, and and uh, for sure the the, the oversight um, the oversight from NASA is much tougher. It was not that it wasn't tough with cargo, but it's really intense for crew. Um, <laughs> so I coming from the right motivations, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's a uh, you know it can be a bit tough on on, on my guys. Um, I mean, I want the woman man of SpaceX, but. Uh, but but uh, you know I know where it's coming from. It's the right right motivation, um, and uh, and there'll be some debates you know going into next year about some of the detail technical details and is this right or that right. Um, but I think uh, we really want to uh, do everything humanly possible to make sure it goes well, um, and um, you know triple check everything, um, and. Uh, Overall, I think it's going, you know, really well. Um, you know, there's getting to like these little small technical bones of contention, which, um, you know, but we're working through those. Um, we're uh, engineers. We live. For, we <laughs> yeah, live for that. Exactly. We live for that. Um, yeah. Um, it, it, and, and some of these things are really like esoteric. I mean, unless somebody's really in the weeds on. Rocket and spacecraft design, it, it will just t sound like you're talking Greek, but um, <laughs> ancient Greek, you know. But um, yeah, but there's, you know, I think it's good to have these debates. Uh, and overall, um, I'm confident that it's going to be a system that, uh, that NASA feels good about and uh, SpaceX feels good about. And I uh, look forward to continuing the partnership into next year. And um, Doing a great job for NASA. Excellent, thank you. Um, and of course, we're looking forward to it. We're excited about.
about it. And, and as you mentioned, we're NASA's working hard with you. Yep. On, uh, on oh yeah. Um, <laughs> And, and yeah, and we're also all down in the weeds on those uh, technical in details. The, yeah. I'm sure you're there. <laughs> yep. Let's see. You Literally see down to the little ball, to the little thing. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sure. <laughs> Where's Gerst? Gerst is here somewhere. That's Gerst's uh, gravy, hey. too. <laughs> Gerst, if you, can't have a, if you can't have a dry lube bolt pitch discussion with Gerst, you know, it's not a good day. <laughs> <laughs> We've, Gerst and I have many, many, just many sort of in the weeds technical discussions. Um, I actually love, I love talking to Gerst. Uh, one of my favorite people in the world, actually. So, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Mine too, but but he's my boss. So I, <laughs> yeah. I have to say that. <laughs> Let's see. So you, you talked. We talked a little bit about commercial crew. We have uh, cargo supply resupply one, yep. which you have the yep. Dragon, which of course Dragon one, which is. Uh, Birth, and, and in fact, you've done a reflight recently with uh, with the oh, dragon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, thanks for bringing that up. You know, because um, that's kind of important. <laughs> yes, it, yes, it uh, is. And again, thanks for the NASA support on that. Um, God, we we really should, uh, t you know, we should have made a slightly bigger deal out of it because it was the first reflown spacecraft since the shuttle, mm -hmm. um, and uh, we kind of forgot to make, you know. Let people know to. I mean, I guess it was there in the details, but we forgot to, you know. I don't think the public even realizes that it's the first reflight of a spacecraft, of an orbital spacecraft since the shuttle, um, which performed uh, very well too. A very good, yeah. good, clean mission. Yeah, it's solid. Um, and I mean, that, that, now that was a case where I should, st <clears throat> in full disclosure, say that <laughs> it cost us almost as much. To, in fact, probably about as much, maybe more. <laughs> <laughs> To We're not it. negotiating a contract here. <laughs> no, I know. I know. I've just, uh, I've just been totally honest here. Um, I, I, our, the SpaceX internal accounting said that it cost us almost as much as building a, 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 a Dragon 1 from scratch. But I suspect our internal accounting was probably being, um, wasn't counting certain things. <laughs> um, there were some circumstances unusual about this one, right? This one had but, some but the water next one, incursions yeah. and things like that. So yeah, yeah. The amount of rework on this particular. But this had a lot of rework. Yeah. yeah. But the next one, we think there's a decent shot of, of being maybe sort of 50% the cost of a new one. Um, and uh, Keep going, my contract. <laughs> here. Yeah, yeah, I'm negotiating against myself here. Yes. Um, <laughs> and, um, but, um, yeah, no, I, I mean, we want to offer the, you know, a best possible uh, deal, deal for NASA, and um, it's always tough to get that top line budget to increase. Hope it does. Um, man, I think so much good be, uh, could, could be accomplished if the NASA top line budget was increased. Uh, people have no idea. You know? um, so, uh, so talk a little bit. So we talk about CRS one and and berthing and CRS two. Yeah. Are we talking about commercial crew? CRS two, the Dragon is yeah. going to its cargo Dragon. It's it's the similar Adam old line of so it's, the, it's, it's, it's the Dragon crew Dragon, two, it's, but yeah. but it's going to dock. And yeah, yeah. so talk about the. And, and uh, good, then we'll have good commonality between yeah, the systems. Synergisms of the, and things like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the I mean the only thing cargo Dragon won't have is the launch escape system. Uh, or it'll still have the logic associated with separating from the vehicle. Uh, so I, I think most likely ca uh, even, even Cargo Dragon 2 um, would be able to su survive a uh, booster anomaly. But I like that word anomaly. Um, <laughs> the, the, uh, we don't uh, like that uh, word either. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. I guess I don't like it. <laughs> anyway. um, the, the, uh, it won't have the, the launch. It'll have everything else on the Dragon, Crew Dragon 2 has except the the thrusters, but I think in most cases, actually, it would still be able to survive reentry um, and re and keep the cargo safe. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but having that commonality is great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, going forward, it seems like you know docking itself, and if you know even beyond testing of systems evolutions and things, it might be beneficial to test on uh, on the cargo version. Yeah, yeah totally. Crew and Absolutely. And I know you've already done some things on on CRS one to prepare for CRS two and. Testing mm -hmm. some uh, TPS uh, uh, repair capability and things like that. It, so. it, exactly. Um, actually, uh, uh, I really, you know, just like to, uh, you know, ex express some appreciation for the the whole CRS team um, because they, they've really allowed us to uh, update the rocket and, you know, 
add cra crazy things like landing legs, um, and um, and been really fair, I think, in, in uh, allowing us to iterate with the booster for for the CRS uh, contract, um, and then uh, uh, and and then as you're pointing out, um, Dragon Two being used for both uh, cargo and crew allows us to iterate on. Uh, uh, with a, just a slight, little more risk on the cargo version um, and prove it out for this crew on board. Yeah, it's really helpful. Excellent. So uh, let's, uh, let's talk about, I, I know we got a few more minutes here and then we'll open it up to questions. But, uh, you know, the, the theme here is uh, for the conference is innovation. Mm -hmm. and, and, of course, we talked already about some innovations in the launch business. But w what do you think needs to be, where are the areas or the thrusts for innovation that we really need both, uh, you know, not not excluding the launch, but but also looking at low Earth orbit. What's sure. in low Earth orbit? Where do we? Where do you think we, as a, <clears throat> as a uh, you know, space industry, need to go and look for our innovation? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I, I think for the long, I, 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 I still believe, and I think many people do, that the, the real the key to opening up uh, space uh, space or orbit. You know, Leo and beyond is um, rapid and complete reusability, um, uh, or near complete reusability, um, like we have with aircraft, um, or cars, or you know, almost any form of transport. Um, now, it's it's super hard with space because this, uh, you know, we live on a planet with pretty high gravity, um, so so it'd be pretty easy if we were on Mars or something like that. Um, but uh, but Earth's gravity is, is really pretty pretty high, and we've got a thick atmosphere, and um, so uh, reus uh, reus reusability is tough. And you're going through, you know, high sort of you've got operating a vacuum, hypersonic, uh, supersonic, transonic, subsonic. Um, that's just a lot of regimes for um, any sort of flying object to go through. Um, uh, but, but reusability, I think, is absolutely fundamental to a breakthrough in uh, access to orbit and beyond, um, Leo, Leo and beyond. Um, anything that can be done in that direction, I think, is, is, is good. Mm -hmm. um, Certainly change the economics of transportation to low Earth orbit, right? Really if fundamental. You get quick reusability, the economic equation, it becomes easier to get to low Earth orbit and do more things. Uh, yeah, <coughs> yeah. I, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, just any mode of transport, like it's, uh, like, and before there was Union Pacific going across the U.S. to California, and there's like hardly any people in California, and people thought building the Union Pacific was just crazy, because you got like nobody there, so why are you building a railroad to nowhere? Um, now, you know, California is the most popular state in the country. Um, Some so people stopped in Texas along the way. Just yeah, yeah. Few, few uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I love not in the summer, by the way. Not I love Texas. Uh, you know, I, we, we do uh, a huge part of our mm -hmm. R&D in Texas, in mm -hmm. Central Texas. A lot of people don't know about that. Um, near Waco, we do um, so Central, Central Texas. We do... Um, you do Bosa Chica down in the south there. That's right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So mm -hmm. we've got a lot of activity um, uh, throughout Texas. Um, we're building, yeah, third launch site um, in South Texas near Brownsville. Um, I think that'll that'll give us good, uh, um, you know, c contingency capability. If there's a say a hurricane coming through the Cape, um, and we still need to get to the station, we could, you know, launch out of South Texas, and that that'll ensure continuity of service. Um, and um, yeah, I really sp I spent a lot of time in Texas. Yeah, it's great. Excellent. <laughs> All right, uh, traffic's not as bad as in Southern California. So. Oh man. Tra so uh, that's the biggest issue with Southern California, traffic <laughs> hell. I mean, it's like, it's just like which level of hell are you in? So it's like, <laughs> if you're in hell. Yeah, Washington's uh, trying to catch up. Uh, <laughs> but um, you, know, you know, we're, I, I mean, this is, I mean, um, you know, we're digging a tunnel. I don't know yeah. if you heard about that. Yeah. 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 Um, so, so it's like, the, the, and the tunnel starts right across from SpaceX HQ. So if you're ever out and you want to see our tunnel. Um, yeah, as long as you promise not <laughs> to close it in after I get no, in. No problem. <laughs> um, it would, yeah, we're digging the tunnel. Um, and uh, it's kind of like a, 
it's sort of, I, mean, I don't know, it's sort of, it, it's like a, actually, oddly enough, it's like a little low stress ac activity because like everyone uh, expects it to fail. Um, and um, I mean, the sort of uh, grown worthy joke that I make about tunnels is that they have low expectations. <laughs> <laughs> There's nowhere to go but down. Yes. <laughs> I can keep going. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> wow. Uh, <laughs> that makes so, sense. You, you're involved in space, you're involved in tunnels, you kind of cover the Yeah, they, kinda, they used to call me Internet Guy when I was in Startup Open Space. Um, hey, this is Internet Guy, uh, Link Space. He's probably going to fail. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so then they stopped saying Internet Guy. Um, I think that's going to say Transport Guy. <laughs> He's a tr transport guy. So, uh, talk, speaking of transports, you know, so today ISS is up there, and, and really the conference is focused a lot on on some of the research and development that's going on there, but and, and commercialization too, by the way. But mm -hmm. what and commercialization? At least NASA's strategy is commercialization will, will be fostered uh, on ISS, and then at some yeah. point in the future, ISS will go away, yeah. and and we 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 expect we hope for a, a vibrant low Earth orbit economy at that point in time. That's cool. And I'm kind of curious what what you see in terms of SpaceX and your transportation relative to that, uh, that economy. What's next for commercial crew after, after ISS? Sure, well, first of all, I don't think the public realizes how cool ISS is. Um, you know, that is an awesome thing that's up there. Um, you know, I, 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 I talk to a lot of people, that, for, first of all, some people don't realize we have a space station. Like, can I, can I be serious? Uh, like, we have a gigantic space station. It's huge. Yeah. <laughs> it's really gigantic. Um, um, I mean, it's a pretty incredible structure that we have orbiting, uh, orbiting the Earth. Um, and I think just, I, I, I'd recommend like, man, we've got to do something to educate the public about the awesomeness of, of, of the space station, because it is pretty amazing um, and, and, and big. Like people just lose sight of like, they think, oh, there's like a little thing. You know, it's big, it's real big. Um, and um, yeah, so. Uh, and, and I was finally getting it to sort of real operational use, um, and um, so that was great. It's like an amazing technological achievement. So, uh, but then, yeah, uh, uh, I, I think the, the, in terms of low Earth orbit stuff, uh, on the commercial side, I think there's a lot of opportunities in um, you know, kind of a global internet capability, so providing internet to parts of the world that either don't have it or where it's very expensive and not very good. Um, and um, you know, so it, like the, the space is really good for providing uh, internet connectivity uh, for sparsely populated or, or low populated regions. Um, so it's not, it's not really a threat to telcos. It's actually going to take um, make tel telcos' lives easier because there are a lot of customers that are very hard to serve where like you know, digging a fiber cable for two miles, they'll never pay off the investment to you know, to get to one house type of thing. Mm -hmm. But um, but from space, you can really serve, serve those customers um, at, 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 uh, at economically sensible rates. Um, there's Earth observation, um, you know, getting better understanding of, um, of uh, crops and climate and uh, natural, sort of, uh, not any natural disaster, uh, you know, information. Um, and, um, no, but I think the if we want to get the, the public real fired up, I think we gotta we gotta have a base on the moon, you know. Uh, and, uh, yeah. It's like that would be pretty cool. Um, and then going beyond that, getting people to Mars. You know? Yeah, certainly sending yeah. people further than we've ever sent them before. I think is yeah. captivating for the people. So yeah, exactly. It's captivating for me. I know that. So. Yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, yeah, just. Uh, you know, having some permanent presence uh, on another heavenly body, um, which would be the, the kind of the moon base, and then the uh, and then getting getting people to, to Mars and beyond, um, and uh, you know that's sort of the that's the that's the continuance of the dream of Apollo that uh, I think um, people are really looking for. Yeah, excellent. You know, this might be a good time to uh, to go ahead and open it up for a few questions from the audience. Uh, where did, where are the um, we're there on the side. I think microphone's on the side.
can't tell if people are aware. I don't know what yeah, the, the lights are so bright, are. it's hard to tell. I know this is a risk asking people to ask questions, but uh, any, uh, any questions? Looks like there's a few people signed up, uh, lined up over here, so go ahead. Uh, hi, Elon, over here uh, from the UK. Pleasure to uh, ask a question to you. Uh, my question is, how are you managing the risks associated with the Falcon Heavy, uh, and particularly the recently announced uh, private launch uh, around the moon? Thank you for your time. Sure. Um, so, <clears throat> the, first of all, I should say Falcon Heavy, that requires the simultaneous uh, ignition of 27 orbit class engines. Um, this is like, you know, a lot that could go wrong there. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I encourage people to come down to the Cape uh, and see the first Falcon Heavy mission. Uh, it's guaranteed to be exciting. <laughs> um, but, it, but it's, you know, this is one of those things that's really difficult to test on the ground. Um, I mean, we can fire the engines on the ground, but, um, and we try to simulate the, 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 the dynamics of having 27 instead of nine booster engines, um, and the, you know, the airflow as it goes through transonic, uh, it's like, it's going to see heavy transonic buffet, um, the, the max Q, what has it behave on a max Q, um, there's a lot of risk associated with Falcon Heavy. Real good chance that that vehicle does not make it to orbit. Um, want to make sure set expectations accordingly. Um, I hope I hope it makes it pass, you know far enough away from the pad that it does not co cause pad damage. I would consider even that a win, to be honest. Um, um, and uh, yeah. <laughs> um, very excited. Major pucker factor, really. Yeah. It's like. Another way to describe it. Um, you know, that, window, that, that dwindles the amount of people who want to ride on that the first time. Right? Yeah. It, well, it gets full a smaller cat. There's still people I'm who saying full do disclosure it, here, man. <laughs> full disclosure. Um, um, I, you know, I think Falcon Heavy is going to be a great vehicle. Uh, just, just like so much that's really impossible to test on the ground. Um, and we'll do our best. Um, and um, it, it actually ended up being way, way harder to do Falcon Heavy than we thought. Because uh, at, at first it sounds real easy. You just stick two first stages on as strap-on boosters. Man, how, how hard can that be? But then everything changes. All the loads mm -hmm. change. Um, aerodynamics totally change. Uh, you've tripled the vibration and acoustics. Um, so it, it, you sort of break the, the qual levels on uh, so much of the hardware. Um, the amount of load you're putting through that center core is, mm -hmm. is, is crazy. Because um, you got two super powerful boosters also shoving that center core. And it's like, so we had to redesign the, the whole center core airframe. Uh, it's not like the Falcon 9, because it's got to take so much load. Um, then you got the separation systems. Right, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it just ended up being really way, way more difficult than we originally thought. Uh, we were pretty naive about that. Um, yeah, but I, I, but it, the nice thing is it's, it's uh, yeah, when it on fully optimized, it's about two and a half times the payload capability of a Falcon 9. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's um, well over 100,000 pounds to, to Leo uh, payload capability. You know, 50 tons could even get up to a little higher than that if, you know, if optimized. Um, and um, and then the, the nice thing is that it does have the throw capability to toss a Dragon 2 in a loop around the moon. Um, and, um, and then dra dragging to itself, uh, the heat shield is um, designed with a huge amount of margin. So it's got enough margin to handle a, a, a lunar reentry. Um, and uh, particularly if we do initial velocity scrub, um, do sort of at least one pass to scrub velocity and then come in on the second pass. Um, um, yeah. But uh, no question, whoever's on the first flight, you know, they're brave. Yes. <laughs> brave. Let's see, let's go over here to this <laughs> side here. Is there a question from over here? Uh, hey, Elon. Uh, Ted Tagami with an uh, educational company called Magnitude.io. 
I had the good fortune of meeting you uh, back in September, watching your five sons launch their own rockets, Black Rock Desert. Oh yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. that and, was fun. Uh, <laughs> and since then, we've actually been able, uh, had the great fortune of sending students' payloads up to the International Space Station, and we're now working with CASIS to extend that. We'd like 50 million students to get on the International Space Station, their experiments on the space station by 2014. Okay. Uh, so my question to you is more about the innovations in education and your thoughts. That same year that I met you and your sons, uh, you announced Ad Astra. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and, and before the uh, advent of Neuralace gets fully implemented, <laughs> uh, what, what are your thoughts on the innovations in education today? Thank you. Uh, just the thoughts on education. Um, well, um, I, I think there's maybe a, um, there are definitely some good schools out there, um, but I think the some of the, the mistakes, at least in my opinion, that I see being made in education is um, that um, people, the, the, the teachers do not explain why kids are being taught a subject. Um, you know, you just sort of get dumped into math and like, well, why are you learning math? What's the point of this? It seems like some, you know, for some people like maybe it's a, I don't know why I'm being asked to do these strange problems. <laughs> uh, but you know, the, the why of things is extremely important. Um, because you know, our brain has evolved to not, to discard information that it thinks is, has no relevance. So then, if on the one hand, you, uh, you're being asked to memorize or learn, uh, say, formulas, um, but you do not know why this is the case, then you have this cognitive dissonance of, it seems irrelevant, but I'm being told to remember it, so I'll be punished. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I better remember it. But so the why of things is very important, and then uh, being able to, and then, and then <clears throat> picking kind of a, a problem, and then uh, using various educational tools to solve that problem, um, like using math or physics or economics to, to solve that problem is far more engaging um, than teaching the tools. Um, you know, it's the difference between if you say, well, we're going to take apart this, uh, this engine um, and, and see how it works and put it back together again. Um, and then in order to take the engine apart, we need you know, wrenches and screwdrivers and a winch um, and Allen keys and, and whatnot. Um, and, 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 so that that, and then in the course of solving the problem of taking the engine apart and putting it back together, you learn about wrenches and screwdrivers and all the tools that you need. Um, and then now you understand the relevance. Oh, this is why wrenches are important. I, you know, whereas if you had a, cl a, a class on wrenches, <laughs> you'd be like, oh, why is it's, I think, very powerful for um, establishing relevance and getting um, kids excited about what they're working on um, and, then, and, uh, and, and having the knowledge stick. Yeah, and so to some extent, fly, you know, building a, a CubeSat or flying an experiment on, on ISS is like that, right? You've, yeah. you've got the you've got yeah. the why or the relevance yeah. and the curiosity exactly. in, in terms of building that yep. uh, that device or that experiment. And uh, I think the results like so it really is cool. Yeah. It, it, it ties to the uh, it, it gives you a really a concrete yeah. example of what uh, what you're learning and why. Yeah, exactly. I think like so, things like CubeSats, uh, exactly. We're, we're the kids say like, okay, w w like, what is a solar panel? How does orbital dynamics work? How do we, um, you know, how do we power this thing? You know, how do batteries work? Electronics, kind of control systems, um, and you, you need to. Th then you're like, oh, we want to make our satellite work. That's why we need to understand all these disciplines. Um, so I think it's like like CubeSat, student CubeSats are, are, are great. Um, like things like design build fly for model airplanes or Formula SAE. Uh, we've got to design build a um, uh, kind of a, a, a race car and, and then you know, race that against other people. That I think those things are very powerful for mm -hmm. uh, learning as learning tools. Yeah, it's very cool. All right, thank you. I see over here another question. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Jacob, and I actually live near the Cape. So my question is not much of a tech question, but more of what your prediction is. So about maybe a hundred years after we develop sustainable colonies on Mars. Do you think, and of course, many other countries will also try to get to Mars, uh, that there would be like a conflict for the best resources on Mars? Um, like in, I guess you could say in sort of like a 
interplanetary warfare, if you know what I'm trying to get at. <laughs> <laughs> this sounds like a video game, doesn't it? Uh, it's an idea. Mars <laughs> attacks or, yeah. Um, yeah. The, uh, you know, I think it's some pretty open territory on Mars. Um, so there's, I don't think we're gonna be, there's gonna be any kind of scarcity. Uh, there's like a lot of land on Mars. <laughs> not many people. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, Unless they're hiding on the backside. Yeah, no, I mean, they're, they're pretty clever. If there are people on Mars, man, they are way cleverer than us because they're hiding well. Um, so, um, yeah, no, there's plenty of land on Mars. It's, I mean, you know, the history of human civilization does contain a lot of war, so I you don't think we, we you know, you go to Mars and that, you know, be war free forever. Um, but uh, but I th there's certainly not going to be a resource based uh, conflict due to scarcity of resources on Mars. I think we're going to go to the, to the Mars as a multinational effort, too, right? So it's not, it's not one country going and another country going and then they're fighting over wars. I think it's countries going together. And, and yeah. uh, so I think we're, we're more likely to be peaceful in that, in that scenario as well. Yeah, but you know, I'd, I'd, I'd actually advocate for. I think it's fine if, if, if countries get together to form teams, but I think it's actually probably better if there are at least, you know, at least two or three uh, country coalitions going going to Mars, um, in a friendly way, um, and and competing to see who can make the most progress. Um, and if you look at, like, say, the Olympics, it would be pretty boring if everyone just linked arms and crossed the finishing line at the same time. <laughs> um, friendly. <laughs> uh, but it would, you know, not be... More like the opening ceremonies, I guess. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so we, yeah, I think friendly competition is a good thing. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Well, I, I think, you know, NASA wants to be part of one of those co coalitions with the United States. And, yeah. And so we're, I know we're actually trying to build such a coalition now. Let's see. Um, from over here, another question? Hi, I'm uh, Yotam Ariel, founder and CEO of Bluefield. We are deploying uh, methane tracking microsatellites. And my question to you, I hope to learn your thoughts on advancing remote sensing capabilities of critical gases on Earth and on Mars. Thank you. Well, that's a pretty esoteric question. Um, remote sensing of, of gases, um, yeah, I think um, that, that's something that's going to be important. Uh, Mar Mars has a number of trace gases that are pretty helpful. Um, it's very helpful that, that Mars has CO2 and nitrogen and argon. Those are, those are like really helpful gases to have in the atmosphere. Um, it's mostly CO2, but that little bit of nitrogen and argon is really gonna be pretty helpful. Yeah. And, yeah. Other ga and whatever other trace gases we can get out of the atmosphere. I don't know, we, we always say that Mars has just enough atmosphere to, uh, it's not enough to be really helpful in terms of uh, arrow breaking, but it sure makes it a lot harder. So it's just enough to be, to be difficult. So, yeah. but, but in terms of in situ research utilization, you know, when yeah. we get there to be able to build, to, to, to get your oxygen and, and hopefully we'll have uh, water that's super and can helpful. build, uh, build hi get hydrogen, manufacture sure. hydrogen on, on, uh, on the planet. So yeah. hopefully and there are enough resources that we don't have to carry everything with us. Well, the, the nice thing, you know, having, if you've got H2O and, and CO2, um, you can build hydrocarbons of, of any kind. Um, you can, so you can build plastics. Um, you can build, well, you know, short chain, long chain hydrocarbons. Um, you know, the, the, the current SpaceX thought for um, uh, kind of a Mars transport vehicle is a primarily methane-based system, because mm -hmm. um, you get to have a kind of a smaller. Uh, I mean, the tanks are half the size with with, with methane. Um, uh, so and and, and uh, yeah, but and, and Mars with with a CO2 atmosphere and a lot of water ice is is great for for that. Um, uh, going beyond Mars, I think there's a lot of merit for uh, hydrogen because then you only need water. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that's that's our sort of current thinking on that front. So we, speaking of that, last last year at Guadalajara at the IAC conference, mm -hmm. you talked about plans to go to the Mars, and and uh, and I know you guys have been working on that since then. Yep. You uh, do you so you plan at some point to talk about that work uh, publicly? Yeah, I'm thinking probably the upcoming IAC in Adelaide. Uh, might be a good opportunity to do the updated version of the Mars architecture because it's it's evolved quite a bit since uh, that last talk. Um, 
Yeah, I, I might ask for uh, questions to be collected ahead of time, and, and for that, I assume. <laughs> um, Good strategy. There were some strategy. very enthusiastic people to the mic at the IAC last time. <laughs> um, I'm but but um, the, the, the you know the, the the key thing that got to be figured out is like how do you pay for this whole you know something to go to Mars? That's for, super expensive, mm -hmm. um, and. Um, I kind of think by kind of you know if, if we downsize the, um, the 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 Mars vehicle, you know, make it uh, capable of doing uh, Earth orbit activity as well as uh, you know Mars uh, activity, then um, you know maybe we could pay for it with by using it for Earth orbit activity. Um, that's that's uh, one of, that's one of the key elements in the new uh, architecture. It's, it's, it's sim similar. It's similar to what was at ISC, but it's a, uh, it's it, it's a bit a little bit smaller, still big, but 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 I think it's um, I, I think this one's got a shot at uh, uh, being real, <laughs> and and uh, on, on the on the economic front, mm -hmm. you know, that's the trick. Okay. All right. Let's see. I think another question from over here. Hi, Elon. Eve Jane Mark. Um, I have mostly one important question and one little aside. Uh, yeah. I, can you talk a little bit about your R&D strategy for your companies, and is it all focused on short-term problem solution, or how much, and in what fashion do you allocate time and money towards R&D spending on some of the long-term goals you're working at? And then just as a little aside for the boring company, are you looking uh -huh. at not only as a habit, uh, as a transportation, but potentially as a habitat um, company? Uh, for ton of not just tunnels, but habitats on Mars or the Moon. Yeah, actually, so I, I do think like getting good at digging tunnels um, could be really helpful for Mars, because mm -hmm. um, like once you've got a, a kind of a, now it would be a different optimization for you know Mars boring machine versus an Earth boring machine, but um, for sure there's going to be need to be a lot of, of ice mining on Mars uh, and mining in general uh, to get raw materials. Um, and then along the way, uh, building um, uh, underground uh, habitats where you know you've got good radiation shielding, um, and you kind of have you know as much. I mean, you could build really an entire city underground if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. uh, I think people are still going to want to go to the surface, uh, you know, um, from time to time. But um, you, you you can build a tremendous amount underground. Uh, with uh, the, the right boring technology on Mars. So I do think that there's uh, some uh, overlap in that uh, technology development arena. Um, and then R&D, um, you know, I, I try to spend as much on R&D as we can at uh, my companies. Um, so we really max out R&D. I mean, I spend most of my time on engineering. Um, um, that's probably 80% of my week is uh, engineering meetings. Um, and so, as, you know, any money that we get in revenue, we, we, we put that right back into R&D. Um, and some of it is longer term. Um, uh, yeah. Um, you know, like, for example, the, you know, Mars vehicle. Um, uh, we're looking at some, doing some Mars communication stuff, potentially with, with, with NASA, been partnering with NASA. Um, and, um, yeah, but one super pro R&D, let's say. Engineering is my most fun thing, so try to dial that to the max. <laughs> <laughs> Over here. Hi, my name is Chris LaFleur. Um, I work for Congress for Representative John Conyers. A couple of days ago, I read about you talking about uh, artificial intelligence and the dangers of it, uh, and how as a, uh, as a businessman, you are totally against regulation and stuff like that, but as a, you know, a human being, you think it's critical that we get ahead of this issue. Yeah. Uh, can you please elaborate on, um, like, why, um, what are you seeing that we don't get to see, and what, as a policymaker, I should be looking to do to sort of, I guess, protect us all? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, um, I think it, it, it is difficult to appreciate just how far um, artificial intelligence has advanced, and how far it is advancing, um, because we have a double exponential at work. Uh, we have an exponential increase in hardware capability, 
um, and we have an exponential increase um, in software talent that is going into AI. Um, so whenever you have a double exponential, it's very difficult to predict. Um, People's prediction is almost always going to be too conservative in terms of thinking it'll be further out than it is. Um, you know, you start to see things like, um, I don't know if you've seen like the, the videos where you can sort of really quite accurately video simulate uh, someone um, and put words in their mouth that they never spoke. Um, you just Google this, it's really pretty amazing. Um, and then they, they had something called a generative adversarial network, uh, had, had two of them um, compete with one another to make the most convincing video. So one would generate the video and then the other one would identify where it, it, it looked fake and, and then that, that would, the other one would fix that and then and they'd go back and forth to the point where you couldn't tell which one was the real, real video and which one was the fake one. Um, and, um, you know, obviously there have been some very public things like the defeat of AlphaGo, or defeat of Go by AlphaGo, the, the world's best Go champion. People thought defeating Go was either never or 20 years away. That was, the world's best Go player was defeated. Um, and now, that same AlphaGo system can defeat the top 50 players simultaneously with 0% of chance of them winning. Yeah. And that's one year later. Um, so the degrees of freedom to which artificial intelligence is able to apply itself are in, in really increasing, I think, by 10 orders of magnitude a year. It's re that's really crazy. Um, so I think, uh, and, and we're starting, and this is on hardware that is really not well suited for neural nets. Um, you know, uh, like a GPU is maybe an order of magnitude better than a CPU, but something, but a, um, a chip that is designed optimally for neural nets is an order of magnitude better than a GPU. Um, and that is, there are a whole bunch of neural net optimized chips coming out. Um, either late this year or, or next year. Um, so I think we should, I think, that, you know, the part of the role of government is to make sure the public is uh, safe, like to take care of public safety issues. And I think, so I think the right move is to establish some government regulatory agency, which at first is just there to gain insight. So. Um, it's not about like shooting from the hip and just putting in rules before anyone knows anything, but you've got to set up the agency, it's got to gain insight. Once that insight is gained, then start applying rules and regulations. Um, we have that for the, you know, for aircraft, the FAA, we've got that for cars, we've got that for, uh, you know, drugs, for food. Um, and I don't think anyone wants the FAA to go away or the FDA to go away or you know, um, any of those regulatory agencies. Um, I think we just need to make sure people do not cut corners on AI safety. It's gonna be a, it's gonna be a real big deal. Um, and it's gonna come on like a, like a tidal wave. So. All right, thanks. I see uh, over here, question. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Anna and I'm a film director and VR producer. And I'm um, currently working on a, on a film, on a documentary film about future scenarios for humanity, which actually brought me to this amazing conference where I can learn and complete my research on the space exploration area. And in the previous few days, there was a lot of talks, uh, which is, I think, an extremely beautiful phenomenon about this kind of dual philosophy behind space exploration and space solutions about solutions that are coming back to Earth that can benefit humankind in a very, very wide area. And today we've been talking about the commercialization of the, of the space uh, area, and it brings a lot of questions to me about social responsibility behind uh, gigantic companies that would actually probably take over how the space industry would develop in the nearest future. So I'm very curious how you see in long term uh, these kind of benefits for people or social goals for, for SpaceX, and especially in the context that 
uh, you are an entrepreneur that invests in infrastructure and transport, hard solution that would probably change the way most of us live and the way we communicate with each other. So I'm very, very curious how you see that in terms of long-term mission, long-term philosophy, and what would be your advice or maybe a kind of security signal for other of your colleagues and for all of us? Phew. Uh. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not sure I, I fully understood uh, the, the question. Um, the, uh, yeah, what well, the answer? Um, um, but yes, um, I, I think mainly about uh, long-term benefits from the R&D endeavors that your companies would conduct that could actually be also not only serving, building a service that can be useful for business or for people, but also benefit the societies in a wider context, and also knowing that it would probably, uh, the, industry, the commercial industry in space would probably develop very quickly and it, it, it will grow. How do you see uh, the social responsibility of the companies who actually do that, and uh, where are the limits of what can be done, what should be done, the same way as you think about, for example, open AI mission in the area of, of, of AI development? So can you tra could be translated into space industry endeavors? Well, I think there's a, a pretty big social benefit uh, or um, civilizational benefit to being a multi-planet civilization. Um, you know, th th that dramatically increases the probable lifespan of human civilization if we are a multi-planet species versus a single planet species. Um, you know, sometimes that is misinterpreted as, well, shouldn't we just focus everything on Earth? It's like, well, you know, but w we should focus almost everything on Earth, but I think there should be maybe 1% or 2% of our resources that um, are applied to making life multi-planetary because there are certain irreducible, irreducible risks uh, for, uh, you know, for our, our, on Earth. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's possible in the future that there, there's some global war that knocks us back many levels of technology. You know, certainly if it was a major nuclear war, it would. Um, and uh, the, the, this, just so the general decay of societies over time, um, we see this uh, throughout history. We, we, you know, if you look at uh, ancient Egypt or, or ancient Rome, um, you know they had reached peak, peak technology levels, and then for reasons that aren't obvious, just declined. Um, and uh, you know, so, so I think just having being a multi-planet civilization. Um, you know, having human bases throughout the solar system, I think, uh, first of all, I think that's very exciting and inspiring, and there need to be things that are exciting and inspiring and, and uh, make you look forward to waking up in the morning. Like, it's like, yay, the future is exciting. <laughs> this is underappreciated, <laughs> you know, like tunnels. <laughs> 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 sorry. <laughs> it's like, sorry. Um, and, um, you know, but th there's got to be things that ma make you excited about life. Um, like, well, you know, it can't just be problem solving, you know, one, one sort of miserable problem after another. It's got to be like, I'm fired up about the future, and here's why, you know? And, and space is one of those things that, can, that does that for people all around the world. Um, you know, when, um, when Apollo 11, you know, when, it, when they landed on the moon, I mean, it was, that was something for all of humanity. It really was, you know? People would, you know, if there's like one TV for 50 miles around, people would walk, you know, they'd walk 50 miles just to go find that one TV to, to watch it happen. Um, so, you know, sometimes people think, well, what about, what about the poor nations of the world? They're like, you know what, it inspire, inspires them too. Um, and, um, you know, we need things like that. We don't, have, we don't have enough of them. All right, thank you. Over here. Hi, Elon. Quick question. I heard that Dragon is no longer planned to land propulsively. Is that true? Yeah, that was a tough decision. It, it, Dragon is capable of landing, pro Dragon 2 is capable of landing propulsively. Um, and uh, it, it technically it still, it still is. Uh, although it, uh, you'd have to land it on 
some pretty soft uh, landing pad because we, we've deleted the little legs that pop out of the heat shield. Um, but it's technically still capable of doing it. Uh, the, the reason we decided not to pursue that heavily is it would have taken a, a tremendous amount of effort to qualify that um, for, uh, for safety, uh, particularly for cr uh, crew transport. And then um, uh, there was a time when I thought that the Dragon approach to landing on Mars, um, we've got a base heat shield and side-mounted thrusters would be the right way to land on Mars. But um, now I've, uh, I'm pretty confident that is not the right way um, and that there's a, there's, a, there's a far better approach. Um, and um, and that, that's what the next generation of uh, SpaceX um, r rockets and spacecraft uh, is, is going to do. Um, so, yeah, so just the difficulty of, of, of safely qualifying Dragon for propulsive landing and the fact that um, from a technology evolution standpoint, it, it was no longer in line with what we were confident was the, the, the optimal way to land on Mars. Uh, that's why we are not pursuing it. It could be something that we bring back later, um, but it's, uh, it, it doesn't seem like the right way to apply resources right now. We're here. Hi, Hi Elon. Um, my name is Elia Overby. I'm a PhD student studying genomics. We've all, made, we've all together made a lot of technological progress um, on space systems. My question isn't about the technology, it's about the biology. Um, what are the principal biological concerns you have about human health on long duration missions, such as a mission to Mars? And um, have you identified any solutions to these problems? Um, well, I'd say uh, <clears throat> going to Mars is not for the faint of heart. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's a risky, uh, dangerous, uh, uncomfortable, and you might die. <laughs> now do you want to go? Yeah. Um, you know, and for a lot of people, the answer is going to be hell no, and for some, it's going to be hell yes. Um, so, um, but it will, you know, there will be issues. Um, I don't think it's like, it's, it's going to be a case of like you get irradiated to death along the way. I don't think that's the case at all. Um, y you know, the, the radiation level is sort of roughly, you know, it, in a worst case scenario, really kind of about equivalent to smoking on the way there. Uh, now, smoking is pretty bad. <laughs> uh, but, um, but I think with, um, we, with, with some moderate shielding, we, we can cut down on um, a large percentage of the incremental radiation. Um, and that should be enough that um, that the the sort of marginal risk of cancer is not something that is going to be a showstopper. Um, that's that's my best assessment to, to date. Um, certainly, learning a lot about solar winds and um, you know fast particles and whatnot. Um, and uh, you know, one of the things that I learned recently that I wasn't didn't, didn't quite understand is that the, I always thought of the particles from the sun, the so, sort of solar wind as going kind of straight out from the sun, but they, they follow the magnetic field lines. Um, so you, you actually can get the particles coming at you from the side, even though you know, it's kind of a, a direction orthogonal to the sun. Um, so you do need some, some amount of uh, pr protection, um, at least on, uh, yeah, on, on, on kind of four, four or five sides. Um, anyway, but I don't think it's, it's, it's not a showstopper, but it's, um, it's, it's definitely, you know, if, if, if safety is your top goal, I wouldn't go to Mars. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a bunch of work going on ISS right now to understand the risk to the humans for long duration. Yeah. Certainly, within, we're in the Van Allen belt, so the radiation mm -hmm. environment's different. Yeah. But, uh, and all part of it is understanding what happens to the humans the longer you stay. So, sure. so far, We've had humans stay a little bit longer than a year, and that's it. So yeah. in the history of the species, they've, we've had someone off the planet for a little more than a year, and we're talking three years to go to Mars. Well, you know, I think you can get the... Perhaps, perhaps shorter, but it's in the years, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, so it, there, there, there's months. potential for, for things out there that we haven't found yet. Yeah. And uh, so we'll, we'll learn more as we go along. 
hopefully learn more before ISS is done. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. That actually, the you know, <clears throat> you know, Mars is only in the same um, sort of rough quadrant of the of, of Earth, six, roughly six months every two years. Um, by same, I mean sort of trans slightly offset because it's like a transfer quadrant, but. Um, but if you can get the ship to and from Mars in, inside that six-month window, then you get to reuse it twice as often. So there's actually a lot of merit to being mm -hmm. able to get to Mars uh, in under three months. If you can get there quick and back, of course, it makes a bigger, a bigger uh, vehicle and, uh, and resupply. So anyway, we'll, uh, interesting problem that we'll, uh, I'm sure we'll work on here yeah. as we go forward. A lot, 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 lot of Earth orbit refueling. Or re pro yeah. pro it's not really mostly oxygen, but it's um, propellant reload. There's no good for, word for propellant for fuel plus oxygen. Uh, <laughs> prop, I guess. Prop, prop load. We'll have, to we'll have to invent a new word, right? So that's, uh, yeah. that's it. Okay, a question over here. Dimitri Stardubov, Forms in Los Angeles. First, thank you very much for digging those tunnels. They will be really handy during Olympics. <laughs> um, my question is, uh, like with Tesla cars, will we see you riding the crew module to ISS and back? Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, I would like to at some point. I would like to. Um, yeah, I, I think... Um, Assuming things work out, you know, I, I, you know, I'd like to, yeah, maybe th three, three or four years, something. Um, yeah, it'd be great. All right, we'll put you right. on the manifest. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Next question over here. Hello, I'm Anna Sofia Bagirayev, and I have kind of a follow-up on the biology question from before. It is one thing to say, obviously, it's not going to be a safe experience to go to Mars, but there are some technologies essential, especially if we're looking to putting humans there permanently, um, that, are going to be have, that are going to have to be developed with biological capabilities. Speaking of like flight suits, habitats, um, eventual artificial biospheres for people to live in, do you see your company playing a part in the development of those technologies? Do you see biology having a place in SpaceX's work, or will that be outsourced to other unrelated companies? Hey, and before you answer, you should know that Anna Sophia over here won uh, a Jeans in Space competition and flew on a SpaceX Dragon. Anna Sophia, was that, uh, was that SpaceX uh, 10? When was that? Eight. SpaceX 8. So, um, as a, yes. Yeah. Oh. Than, than I am now. So uh, anyway, so good luck with your answer. Sure. <laughs> um, uh, biology obviously has a significant role to play in any kind of uh, permanent Mars base or city. Um, I mean, for, for SpaceX, you know, we, we're, we're trying to make sure we can get people there reliably at a, at a cost they can afford um, and get cargo there at, at, a, at, a, at, a, at the right cost number. You know, because there's, there's, there's kind of a threshold cost per ticket or a cost per ton to the surface of Mars, um, below which uh, a self-sustaining city can develop and above which it cannot. Um, that, that sort of critical um, sort of economic and te technical threshold is, um, is, is, what we're, is what we're focused on at SpaceX. Um, I think we'll probably also have to do a pivot of work on propellant depot, uh, basically a propellant plant on Mars. Um, but then our, t our intent is to, uh, uh, you know, we, we don't want to get in the way of, of what others are doing. Like, we want to make sure that, uh, let's say if somebody makes an investment and wants to do something on Mars, create a, uh, you know, a business or do some scientific endeavor, that SpaceX does not compete with them, you know, because they need to feel like, okay, they're, we're not going to just go in and compete with them arbitrarily. Um, we we, we want to make sure that they, 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 they feel it's going to be a fruitful environment uh, to be the, you know to go there and and and, um, and, and, and do something special. Um, so our focus is going to be on transport, kind of fundamental utilities, survivability, 
Um, and, and you know, we'll, and we'll do more if we need to do more. Uh, but um, but we want to make sure that that lots of people can go and do all sorts of things on Mars or the Moon, um, and not feel like SpaceX is going to do anything but try to help them. Uh, we don't want, we don't want to interfere or compete. Um, you know, they they got to feel like the opportunity is there. Next question over here. Hi, Elon. Um, my name is Tracy, and I'm not here for any reason related to my career or to my area of study. I'm actually here as a very cool and only slightly overbearing mother <laughs> uh, to my 10-year-old daughter, Harper, and a sister to my 14-year-old brother, Ben, who are both in the audience today, and who think of you the way that I guess I thought of Madonna at the same age. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. so, hey, that, that, that gives you some, uh, that's, that's some high praise there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. In the spirit of that, I wanted to get um, your advice you see me for dance. two kids who are <laughs> very interested in space and engineering and entrepreneurism. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> space engineering and yeah. entrepreneurialism. What's your advice? For oh, What's advice. your advice? Um, yeah, well, you know, there's a lot of uh, technical problems to solve. Um, so I guess we sort of, you know, start studying kind of engineering and physics and biosciences and that kind of thing would be the um, way to go. Um, yeah, um, a lot going to be a lot of problems to solve to to make a city work on Mars. Um, you know, we were thinking of just as a well, s sort of a semi joke, putting a. a job description on our website for uh, urban planner in brackets Mars. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, you know, there's, there's, there's going to be just a tremendous amount of problem solved. There'll be, there's just a lot of building, building and problem solving. So those are like the right, you know, skills to work on if, 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 if someone's interested in going beyond Earth or, you know, space in general. Thank you. We're glad you're uh, we're glad you're here. Glad your kids are here too. They're uh, they're the future for all of us. So thanks for coming. See you over here. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Gerard Valle, NASA Johnson Space Center, and my question is: uh, In your uh, quest to um, colonize Mars, do you uh, foresee utilizing uh, expandable spacecraft modules um, as a stepping stone or, or even a final final utilization? Well, I think there's definitely going to be <clears throat> inflatable things on, on Mars itself. Um, you know, in the journey there, there might be some amount of inflatable, but um, we're not currently baselining that. Um, but on Mars itself, uh, I think there'd be quite a lot. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Inflatable and uh, and uh, perhaps just building it with the materials that's, uh, that's yeah, already and, present. Yeah, That'd be exactly. The key. Local materials are key. You don't have to carry it with you. Yeah, tunnels. Tunnels. <laughs> <laughs> you got to get that tunnel, that boring machine there, though. That's going to be. Uh, it's, well, right now the Earth ones are really heavy, like really heavy. Right. Well, they're um, not built by aerospace engineers. No. There. <laughs> You're not worried about weight for an Earth tunneling machine. You like actually want one that's nice and heavy. Um, but for a Mars one, you'd have to redesign it to be super light. That's a tricky one. And then just taking into account the different conditions on Mars and everything. Yeah. So, um, yeah. It's Real interesting, the, um, you know, the, the Curiosity rover and the tires being chewed up. Very f foreign environment to us and even in very subtle ways. So. Yeah. Let's see, uh, next question here. Wake Forest University that makes uh, brain-machine interfaces. Uh, so uh, what do you think this technology, how is it useful for uh, humans when they uh, you know, go into low Earth orbits or even deep space explorations? And do you have any plans in that direction? Well, the, the, reason, for, the reason I wanted to create Neuralink was uh, primarily as an offset to the existential risk associated with uh, artificial intelligence. Um, I think w we will, human intelligence will be not, I mean, we will not be able to beat um, AI 
so then, if you know, as the saying goes, if you can't beat him, join him, kind of thing. Um, so I think having some, you know, some basically find a way to to, to link, um, you know, uh, human will on mass to the outcome of of AI. Um, having AI be an extension of individual human will. That's really the point of Neuralink. Now along the way, I think there'll be a lot of good that's achieved in uh, addressing uh, any, any brain damage that's, you know, as a result of a stroke or a lesion or something congenital um, or just, you know, loss of memory when you get old, that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, you know, that'll, be, that'll happen well before it, it, it becomes a sort of, um, you know, brain, AI, symbiote situation. Um, so we plan, it, it, you'll see it coming. It'll be, it, won't, it, won't, it won't happen all of a sudden. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do think it, it, it increases the long-term relevance of human exploration. Um, and um, yeah, and yeah, I, I, think, I think it's, for, for me it increased my motivation long term that that it doesn't just need to be done by robots you know um, yeah I don't know if that answers your question but does that answer your question oh yes okay, okay. <laughs> all right let's see maybe we're uh, one more question here and we'll uh, we'll wrap it up uh, on the left here Okay. Hi, uh, Kalle from Space Nation. Uh, as we are building the first global astronaut training program for everyone, my question relates what you earlier said to the in about the International Space Station and how it's a shame that it's not better known around the world, as probably compared, for example, the shuttle program. So, uh, and thinking that in the future we need thousands and more space pioneers. So, how do you see the significance of this public engagement? and especially in the time where we have more and more tools to do that. And, and do you have specific plans on that and how you see that uh, affecting, accelerating, or does it have and that kind of effect for the whole uh, humanity's transition to space and, and the new space era? Sure. Well, I, I think just getting more, more uh, human space flight is going to automatically engage the public. As you point out, the, the, you know, with the space shuttle, there was a lot more engagement when the space shuttle was launching. Um, I think um, if, if the public, public sees some some path, even if it's long term, where they themselves may be able to go to orbit or beyond or to, you know, to the moon or Mars, I think their interest level increases dramatically. And it may not be even that that they want to go, but they have a son or a daughter or brother or friend that really wants to do it and, and, and so they want to support this, their you know, friends and family uh, in, in, that, in that ambition. Um, but it really needs to be something ultimately that looks like it's going to be accessible to uh, a large number of people. Um, and then I think we'll get a large number of people engaged. And one of the things about engagement too, I think for, for the U.S. anyway, will be we have had people launch from the United States, so yeah, absolutely. I can't tell you how many people around the world have said, oh, you know, oh, you guys are still flying. Well, absolutely, we never stopped flying. Yeah. We've had people living on board uh, ISS, uh, you yeah. know, for almost 17 years, mm -hmm. and uh, but they don't see the smoke in the fire, right? Yeah, they yeah. see that they exactly. say they knew they turn on the TV and there's a shuttle going and it's got seven people on board and they see it. And uh, nowadays, at least in the U.S., it's half a world away. Yeah, so. Yeah. Here in a week, a week from Friday, we'll be launching three people. Yeah. But uh, it doesn't feel the same as if it was happening in, in our backyard in, yeah. uh, in Florida. Absolutely. So, so we're looking forward to, uh, to that happening very soon here in, uh, in the U.S., uh, and uh, we wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Thanks very much for being here today. Thanks for, uh, for joining the conference. <laughs> You're a big part of ISS and a big part of, of, of the research and development that goes on on ISS, so, so thanks very much. I'm glad you've been able to help, be helpful, and thanks for having me. Yeah. I'd like just to uh, extend my thanks also for an um, incredibly insightful and frank discussion that you guys have had with the group, so we 
really truly appreciate it. And um, as my takeaway, I, uh, since we are at the ISS R&D conference, I loved your quote of, I don't think people understand how cool ISS is. Right. So I hope you all go <laughs> and spread that word and tunnels are cool too. So, uh, <laughs> We appreciate it. Um, we're running a little bit late, so if you're going to the technical sessions, if you could kind of walk quickly to them, um, we'll begin them as soon as the rooms fill up. And um, for those of you that are going to the congressional reception, that'll start at 6 o'clock this evening at the Rayburn House Office Building, and then we will start again tomorrow at 8.15. So thank you all very much.